My clock here in Colorado is showing that it is high noon in Colorado, so we are going to go ahead and get started. Um, as people continue to join us, feel free to introduce yourselves. Um, just very quickly, before we get started with our main presenters for today on helping homeschoolers, I just wanted to do a brief intro for CSL in session in case you haven't attended before. Most of you are probably used to attending one-way webinars where you sort of just listen and learn. And I don't know about you, but um, I find that after about 10 minutes, I kind of stop listening and I'm checking Facebook or my email or working on another project. So we're trying to shake things up today and um, have a conversation um, as we talk about helping homeschools because we want to hear um, what you guys have experienced as well um, in addition to our presenters. So the main way that the majority of you will be communicating today is in the chat um, and most of you have taken the opportunity to introduce yourselves and let us know where you are logging in from so we appreciate that but feel free as we ask you questions to share resources, ideas, thoughts and questions. Um, both Beth and I will be um, checking the chat area to make sure that questions are not missed um, to help our presenters as they're sharing some of their information. If for some reason you experience any audio issues, um, you can chat with me. I am um, the um, kind of host for today. Way up at the top left where the attendees are, I'm the one that says Colorado State Library and if you hover over that you should be able to start a private chat with me and as mentioned before we are recording today's session as well. We also may ask you at times to raise your hand. I don't know if we're going to do that today. It may be spontaneous, but um, you can do that also in kind of the upper left area. There's a place where, and Kathy Wilkins is demonstrating it, she is raising her hand for us. Nice. Um, but uh, you don't have to raise your hand if you have questions. You can just type those in the chat, but we may use that as an opportunity for taking a poll. Um, so, without further ado, I am going to introduce the special guests that we have for today. The first is Beth, who is our Youth and Family Services Consultant. She works with me here at the Colorado State Library. We also have Gail, who is a children's librarian for the Pikes Peak Library District, and Jessica, who is a children's specialist. And I see that I typed her um, title in twice, just to make sure that everybody knew that she is a children's specialist at the Pikes Peak Library District. So I think without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to um, Gail and Jessica. Welcome. This is Gail, and uh, one reason that we're doing this today is because we want to to um, to give you guys some ideas on what you could do in your own library uh, to help homeschoolers. Um, I've been involved with our homeschool committee for over eight years, and Jessica can tell you what she's been doing. She's been helping with the um, um, some programming at her branch for quite a while. Six years. Yeah, about six years. Okay. We'll try to make sure that, that we tell you who's talking so you can make sure you can tell the difference. Um, anyway, but uh, we just do hope that you'll come back, come away with at least one idea today. Um, we do have a poll to start this off. Um, and I was wondering if you would answer this for us. It says, did your library currently offer homeschool programming? Either yes, no, or I don't know. Okay, it looks like uh, the majority don't yet, uh, but about a third of you do. Um, so that's good. Well, I hope those of you that don't uh, will be inspired to try something when we're done today. And those of you, of you that do, I hope that you'll be willing to share some of your ideas with us too. Um, Jessica is going to talk a little bit about just what homeschooling is. For those of the, you that don't do the programming yet, you might have a few questions about this. Hi guys, this is Jessica and we just wanted to start a little bit um, with a little bit of background for you. We're assuming that most of you guys are familiar with the concept of homeschooling, so we're not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about it. But we do want to stress that we've discovered that homeschooling can be many things. Um, Colorado's Department of Education sets up specific guidelines on what homeschooling is, the biggest point being that it's schooling not under the supervision and control of a school district. But we found that homeschooling looks very different family to family and sometimes even kid to kid within a family who homeschools. 
Colorado law defines it even further, setting up age ranges and testing parameters. However, we've got a lot of families with children younger than seven and older than seven who consider themselves homeschooled. So when we talk to our families, we find that in addition to the families who teach their children full time, families who attend homeschool enrichment programs through schools also consider themselves homeschooled, as do some families who choose online education, although both of those are considered public education by the Department of Education and are counted in their statistic enrollment numbers. Okay. All right. <laughs> we want to talk about um, working in the library. We really consider it part of our job to support homeschool parents in their quest to educate their children. But we want to talk a little bit more about why we're singling out this one group of patrons. Okay. And um, before we start talking about that, uh, we want to um, just, if you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit about yourselves, uh, we have another poll for you. I made a mistake. <laughs> we did miss one. I don't know if we can go back on that or not. Um, we can when the. Okay, okay, that's great. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, let's jump ahead just a little <laughs> bit. But that's great. It looks like. It looks like most of you just enjoy working with this community, or it's part of your job description. Um, a few of you guys were homeschooled or have homeschooled your children. All right. So there were 1.77 million homeschoolers in the United States in 2012, which is a 15.4 increase from 2007. Unfortunately, that's the most recent statistic that we have, but we do believe that that number has only increased in the recent years. Looking just at Colorado, a little over 16,000 homeschoolers during the current 2015-16 school year. Um, that number combines the homeschoolers who were doing those enrichment programs plus those not participating in any school district sponsored programs. And just a little from our own district, um, 2,500 homeschooled kids and teens participated in our summer reading program in 2015. So we've got another question for you guys, and if you could respond in the chat box. Does your library keep stats for homeschoolers participating in your summer reading program? It looks like a lot of you guys do. Some of you guys don't. Um, if your library already keeps track of what school a child attends when they register for summer reading, it's really easy to keep track of how many homeschoolers participate as well. The biggest reason, however, for doing homeschool programming was just our families. We have such amazing homeschool families who utilize the library often and use it to supplement their children's education, and we really just wanted to be able to do more for them. Um, this family in the photo has been coming to the library for many years. And I'm, I'm told now that the little boy in front is now taller than his mother, which is really, really fun. All right, we're going to start out. Um, Gail's going to talk a little bit more about um, how our district started supporting these families. Okay, and we, because I jumped ahead, we always, already did the poll about telling a little bit about yourself. So thank you for doing that. We just wanted to kind of get an idea of who, who was uh, listening today. Um, we started out with a homeschool committee. Uh, we started this more than 10 years ago. Um, I've been involved with it, like I said at the beginning, for about eight years or a little more than that. Right now, the makeup of our committee uh, has three people who have, have some experience with homeschooling. Um, Tina homeschooled six children for 23 years. Melody homeschooled one child for 13 years. And, and that son of hers is now one of our favorite IT uh, staff members here at PPLD. Um, and Krista was homeschooled herself for grades K through 12. So we have quite a, we have some good um, good resources on our committee. The rest of us just have a passion for working with homeschoolers and, and we we listen to what what uh, the other three have to say and we, we 
I really appreciate their input and we all we all work with programming for the for the homeschoolers. And I'll see. I'm actually going to go back because I have a I have a question that I don't want to forget this time. Um, if you were to, if you were setting up a homeschool committee or maybe you have a homeschool committee or a or a planning group um, together put together for this purpose, um, who else could you invite to be part of that group? Yes, they are all staff members. We have retired teachers, um, online charter schools, teachers, okay, leaders of cooperatives, parents, museum staff, parent representative. Those are great. Um, we did try to have a parent representative on ours one time, um, but she was so busy she really wasn't able to come to our meetings. So it didn't work for us. But I think it would really be beneficial to have someone from a support group or a co homeschooling co-op in there. So those are great. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'm going to show you some of the things that we have. We sponsor programs and events that, that first of all, support the parents who are teaching their children. One of the one of our favorites and one of the the uh, homeschoolers' favorites is our used curriculum swap. We do this once a year. Uh, it's usually after most of the used curriculum sales are over, uh, so it's at the end of Ju end of June is when we do it. But it's totally free. People bring whatever they no longer want. They put it out on tables. Other people come in and just take whatever they want, and uh, it's great. The the uh, families that bring items in go home with with less than they brought, and they're just thrilled. People that come in to look, um, I've heard many people say they found exactly what they wanted, which was just a, just a, a really surprised to me when you come to something like this but uh, everybody's been thrilled so we're we're real pleased with that one another popular one is our homeschool resource fair we do this once a year at the beginning of the school year uh, and we invite we invite lots of community resources we have support groups enrichment programs the enrichment programs are generally from the public school districts uh, we have music lessons and sports and scout groups um, and we uh, we have had in the past uh, a museum that came that they had uh, volunteer opportunities. So it just and it changes from year to year. But I've it's gotten we've done it often enough now that I'm starting to get phone calls and emails asking if if a certain group can be a part. Um, I've already heard from one group telling me now that they want to be in the one we're having this coming August. So um, they the community is excited about it as well as the homeschool families. Uh, homeschool tools is our opportunity to show homeschool families what PPLD has to offer. It's mostly online tools. Uh, we have had children's activities there also uh, just because homeschool families have a tendency to come in mass uh, so they don't leave the kids with a babysitter. They bring everybody and so it's much help, much more helpful to them if we can keep the kids occupied while the parents are learning something too. We've had a few special presentations. And Gail, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, this is Christine. We just had a quick question that some other people may be curious as to what kind of, what size community you all serve in, at Pikes Peak? Um, well, I'm, I would be nice if I knew that. <laughs> we we okay. sort of is all of El Paso County, which yeah. last time I looked. Jessica's me, checking yeah, her phone. Let me see. <laughs> I will, I will look up some stats. Uh, Gail, go ahead and talk about this, and okay. I will, we'll get back to you on that question. OK. Um, special presentations we've had. Uh, we've also had these filmed so that we could put a DVD in our, the DVDs in our collection. Uh, we've had the homeschooling methods, and that's what this graphic is. It's just some of the various methods that homeschoolers use to teach their kids. It's really amazing, the variety. Uh, we had that one. Uh, we've had uh, mom come in to. Uh, share what she has learned about teaching her special needs child um, and with homeschooling. We've also had a homeschooling 101 class. We need to, you know, we've had somebody come in who knows the law and knows what people need to do to help to get started in homeschooling and that was very popular too. Okay, um, it looks like our El Paso County population is uh, about 655,000. 
Um, that's a couple of years old, so it's probably a little bit bigger than that. But, but um, that's that's approximately what we're serving. Okay, uh, we also have a, uh, a homeschool hub website. It's part of our PPLD website. We have a blog that that lists some of the activities that we have coming up for homeschoolers. We also have a resource page that has lots of um, online links to all sorts of things from how to get started in homeschooling to what um, after school activities might be available in, the, in our area and uh, people are finding it very very helpful. We also send out monthly electronic newsletters. We have one that is just events um, that, uh, that are coming up the, the coming month. We also have one for our science lab program uh, and this is something we also we have a program once a month and I'll talk to you about that in a little, in a little bit. Um, one of our, the ladies on our committee also puts out a book, the book list, the new books and cool books, and she highlights things and also always has uh, some really neat comments. And that's his Melody. She's the one that, that uh, homeschooled the, her son who now works for PPLD. And she always has some great comments about the different books that she chooses. We have a quarterly publication, the Homeschool Connections. Uh, everyone on the homeschool committee contributes to this. We write articles or put in book lists. We have we one of the pages has some activities for both t kids and teens. Um, we have um, some uh, hi we highlight some of our databases. We have ads for upcoming programs. So it's it's pretty full. And like I said, it comes out quarterly um, with this with the uh, seasons. The next one will be coming out at the beginning of March. I think it. I think it just arrived, but I haven't seen it yet. I haven't opened the box yet. Uh, we also, of course, have books um, at, here at East Library, where I'm located. We pulled our homeschooling resources off the regular shelves and put them all together. So we have magazines. We have uh, copies of Homeschool Connections back issues of Homeschool Connections that people can pick up. Uh, we also have books, and we decided to put a identifying uh, label on our books. It's, we put a, uh, a, uh, a green spine label protector over the spine label, so it turns it green. And that way our shelvers know where to put it. And for those locations that don't pull them out, homeschool families can find them more easily on the shelf because they have this have green on them where none of the others do. Uh, we also use displays. Um, Tina, who is the one, one on our uh, committee who uh, homeschooled for over 20 years, put this display up for the homeschool science fair that we just had last week. And so, she, and she really enjoys doing all this. She's, she's really having fun with, with uh, helping the homeschool families that, that come into her location. She also put together discovery packs about six months ago. Um, these have been so popular homeschool families wishes that all locations did it, but none of us know know enough about what the homeschooling uh, families want as far as as specific um, resources. And Tina puts together nonfiction and fiction and picture books and easy readers and DVDs and sometimes music CDs, anything that would go along with the, the theme that she has chosen. And they're just flying off the shelves. Okay, hey, uh, Jessica is going to talk a little bit about the family programming that we that we have. Um, before I do, I do want to jump in. I saw that Deborah had a, a question in there about um, whether the public library should encourage homeschooling, and I think Anna had a great answer. Um, we're not; it's not a matter of really home, encouraging homeschooling above public education or public education above homeschooling. Um, it's just that we. Um, want to support the needs of all of our patrons and homeschoolers are one group of patrons that we saw a need that we could fill and um, you know we do a lot of things for our our public and our private homeschooler or our private schoolers as well and Amanda had a great answer as well um, a lot of our our homeschoolers use use it as as um, access to materials. All right. So I hope that answered Deborah's question. Um, we're going to jump into family programming. 
One of my favorite programs that we do for homeschoolers is our Homeschool Lunch Bunch. It's a monthly program geared towards whole families, all ages welcome. A different topic explored each month. There's about 45 minutes of a different educational activity, and then we clean up and the families can stay and socialize, eat their sack lunches. The best way we found to do this program is to look for free programs from our community partners. Any place that will do a school program for free is usually willing to come and do one at the library for the homeschoolers. So I'm going to have another quick question for you guys that you can answer in the chat box. What community organizations do you have in your area that you might contact for free or low cost homeschool programming? If you'll just brainstorm and type some answers in the chat box. Museums, that's a great one. Park districts or um, uh, nature centers, 4-H, I love that one. The Botanic Garden. The zoo. The Biobus Education from Georgia State, that's an interesting one. We might have to have Charlene tell us a little bit more about that one. University, fire department. All right, so I've, I see a lot of great options in there. Um, you might also consider local business owners or homeschool parents with special talents. We've had a local beekeeper who came and brought honeycombs and honey and hives. And I've had a parent who spoke five languages who came and taught sign language to the kids. So as you can see, there are a lot of possibilities out there. I love, I love the, all the options that we've got out there. So one, um, one partnership that we've made is uh, History Colorado. For those of you in Colorado, you might be familiar with it, but um, if you're outside of Colorado or just not familiar, they're a history center in the Denver area, and they run these amazing school programs, one of which um, is called Moving Day, and they've loaned that kit to our district. It involves a huge map, artifacts, tons of hands-on fun learning about the different peoples throughout Colorado's history. And we've used it with many different groups of homeschoolers at many of our different branch locations. And then just another idea, if you run a Lego club at your library, you might consider doing one just for your homeschoolers. Um, so if you run it during regular school hours and advertise to the homeschoolers. Legos are always popular and the families really enjoy the chance to build together and socialize. And I'm going to turn it over to Gail. She's going to talk about some of our other programs. Hey, uh, we have a monthly, we have monthly science programs that our awesome volunteer puts together. We have a, a homeschool dad volunteer. He's a, his uh, business is, is chiropractic. Um, and he has been organizing our um, science programs probably for about the last year and a half and everyone has been really enjoying it you know, as you can see in these pictures you know, we've had uh, we had someone who came in with who, who raises chickens and she brought eggs in several different um, several different uh, stages of growth um, I think they had um, I think they lost their heat one time and so had some that didn't didn't hatch, so she was able. To, she brought those in, so the kids could see what the little chickens actually looked like inside the egg, and the little boy's fingers. He's squishing the egg yolk around, I think, and I think there's a little embryo in there too. But we've also we've also had mind storms for the kids, uh, particularly the older ones, and it's the older kids that we still struggle to um, to get in here to to participate in our programs. But the mind storms we had we had about ten of them, which is probably it was, it was pretty good. Um, we've also, we're also planning on having an anatomy and clay program, uh, which uh, PPLD, I guess, is one of their pilot locations. And so we've been trying to, to use their, uh, um, their resources. And so far, they've, they've turned out really good. I, we haven't actually used them for the home, just specifically homeschoolers yet, but we plan to. And when we do these, we always try to do them as a multi-age program if we can. Sometimes we do divide them up by age. We've done that several times recently. We just had our science fair, like I mentioned. 
Um, this young man had an electricity experiment, which was absolutely awesome. I was really blown away by it. Um, but anyway, we open our science fair to any homeschoolers, all ages. So we had we had a five-year-old there, and we also and this young man, I believe, was in eighth grade. Um, we, they get have a t an opportunity to talk about the projects they they have. We don't judge them. This is not one of the big science fairs that you know regional type thing. It's just it's just an opportunity for them to come and show people what they've been learning in science. So some projects are much more simple than others. Some don't have as elaborate displays as he does. Um, but they all get a chance to talk about their projects. It gives them a little more experience with public speaking. Um, we also don't give prizes. We do give them a certificate of participation, and they, they enjoy getting that. And um, uh, this is Beth. I'm just going to interrupt. We did have a great question. If someone who goes to a public school wants to participate, uh, can they do so? You know, I don't think we would tell them no. Um, the schools have science fairs, though, and that's why we offer one for the homeschool kids because they don't have that opportunity. Um, and so, but you know, they, I guess we probably wouldn't even know if it was a public school child. We do have the science fair in the morning on a Friday. Um, so, unless the, the student was out of school that day, they probably wouldn't be able to come anyway. You know, so it just it depends. You know, we've we've always said even for our we do our science labs on Friday too. Um, you know, and then sometimes public schools are out on Friday. They have teachers meetings or whatever. If those kids want to come, that's great. We're not going to tell them they can't. Uh, the, you know, there's a public library. Anyone is welcome. Uh, the science fair, like I said, we just had it, so we do it in February. And. Um, all of our homeschool programs are not necessarily in the morning. We've discovered here that Fridays seem to be best. Um, so our normal mon monthly science science programs, science lab programs, we hold on Friday afternoon. Um, when we do our curriculum swap, we do it on a Thursday. For some reason, that seems to work. <laughs> and it's my longest day at work. I'm part time, so it's my longest day at work, and so it works for me too. Uh, but it's, yeah, it, it, we do it at a time when a lot of the homeschool families aren't teaching anymore because it's the end of end of June because they'll take a summer vacation too. Not everybody, but a lot of them do. Um, and so Thursdays work for that. But we've started having most of our big programs on Fridays, either morning or afternoon, and they seem to work best. By then, homeschool families are ready to take a break from the from teaching during the week. Um, for the homeschool swap, the families bring their items with them when they come that day. So generally, I'm not collecting things, although um, periodically someone will call and say they have some things to give away, but for some reason they can't go to the swap, and so I'll I will get the, get it from them and just hang on to it. We had a lady last year who had a whole basement full of homeschool resources that she was done with. She didn't drive, um, and she was a little on the feeble side. And so my husband and I drove over, and we filled our entire minivan full of her stuff, and brought it to the to the uh, to the resource or to the uh, um, curriculum swap, and uh, put everything out. And uh, most of it went, which we were thrilled. Uh, the excess that's left over, people are expected expected to take it home with them. Um, we don't have a place to take it. We have a friend's bookstore in our location, but they won't take textbook kind of things, and they won't take manipulatives, which a lot of people bring. Um, if there's some you know, fiction, kids fiction or teen fiction, they'll take that. But generally, we have people take it home. I Sometimes they will take some things down to the store and see if they'll take it. But um, the lady that gave us the uh, van load of things last year, we have a, a used bookstore in town that kind of caters to, it's a, it's a it's a Christian book, a Christian used bookstore, and they have a huge homeschool area. So last year, we took our drove our van over there right afterwards and just gave them everything. And so they were thrilled to have that. Okay, let's go into the next one. Hey, we also have a game day, and we do this in August. Um, we do it towards the end. Uh, we've done it in September, and the weather is a little bit iffy in Colorado in September. So August, end of August seems to be best. And this is just a fun day kind of a, to get get the school year started. And uh, families come. We, we put out a lot of uh, sports equipment. We put out 
balls and hula hoops and we, we bring sidewalk chalk for those kids who just want to be creative we have bean bags we have bubbles for the for the little kids um, and and actually this past year we had even more bubbles and as you can see in that one picture uh, with Pikes Peak in the background um, the kids just loved them we had bubble liquid everywhere afterwards it was kind of a mess but it was, the kids had a great time uh, but the, they the kids jump rope they play soccer they uh, play um, games that don't that they don't need any equipment like mother may I I don't know if any of you remember that or not um, I'm probably older than a lot of you but uh, um, they just have a good time the parents get involved the, um, the first couple of years sometimes the parents would just sit back and let the kids play last year most of the parents were playing with the kids so it's it's morphing a little bit over time um, but we still have always have a great turnout and it's just lots of fun we happen to have this park happens to be right behind my location so it makes it pretty easy Hey, um, our art show, we run this a little bit like the science fair. Uh, we don't have prizes, and it's open to all homeschoolers, um, no matter what age. Uh, and we, we, uh, just, we put everything up for a whole month. Uh, in fact, we're going to be having our art show in April. And we display it in the children's department only because that's where we have space to hang everything. Uh, we, we'll take any kind of art. It can be 3D or 2D. Uh, we have a lot of wall, wall space. We also have a locked glassed in, glassed in display case. And so if we have sculptures, last year we had some, some uh, wood carvings. Um, and so those things will go in there just to keep them safe. Uh, but uh, we, we have art shows for the public schools also. And so we thought that since the homeschool families don't have the opportunity to display art like on, in the school hallways, that we would we would have something here at our library so that they can do that. And I think one of the other locations is talking about having something simple, similar, maybe in a different time of the year. So we might have two of these eventually. Hey, um, let's see. We also have uh, one of the ladies on our on our committee used to work at a presidential library. She has a history background loves primary sources and recently put together a primary source workshop for older kids for uh, like upper middle school and high school age kids and uh, that has worked really well she's hoping to do it periodically during the school year um, just because you know kids need to learn these things and they ordinarily don't have access to primary sources we have a special collections department uh, that that does have loads of pictures and that's what this is this is a picture I don't I honestly don't know what year it is but it's a picture of one of a kind of a historic hotel that burned down in the early 1900s hey um, I was wondering uh, before we go on um, what other programming ideas do you have uh, I'm, I'm sure maybe we've gotten you thinking about some things that either you've done or that you'd like to do? Well, you guys are typing in the chat box. I'm going to answer a couple of those questions that I saw pop up. So I saw um, Jamie Lynn asked, do we have other programming that homeschoolers are welcome to attend? Homeschoolers are welcome to attend any of our regular programs. We run um, a variety of different things from birth on up. We've got like an elementary um, maker lab. We do after school programming at a lot of our locations. We do, um, you know, regular story times and toddler times and that kind of thing. And they're welcome to attend all of those. Um, we have movie nights and family fun and that sort of thing as well. Okay, and I see there's a question about if there's registration. Um, generally, for these larger programs uh, that we do, we don't ask for registration. Some of some things when we do the science fair, we do so we know how many tables we have to have set up. Um, and so the, and we, uh, when, we set them, when we set that up, we also try to, to put kids of, of about the same age together so we don't have one really um, fantastic display from an you know, upper, upper um, middle school student next to a five-year-old, just so they, they, don't, you know, they don't compare too well. So, so anyway, so we do that. Um, for the, the uh, curriculum swap, I also ask people to register just so I know how many tables to set up. Um, but generally, some the, for the bigger things, the science labs, science lab programs, we don't. 
the primary source workshop she did because she had a, a uh, limited number of spaces that she limited number of space for, for kids to be to uh, sit. Um, I'm trying to think, um, game day we don't. The art show, basically they sign up when they show up with their artwork. Um, so you know, so I guess it, it depends on what it is. Sometimes with our, particularly with our science program, it is a problem if we haven't done that just because we don't know how many to expect. And so if we're trying to, to either, if we want to divide them up by age, let's say, and we need to know how much space we need for each age group, we're just guessing. And so it is a problem, but we also find out, and I'm sure this happens with the general population too, but homeschoolers don't seem, for something like this, they may not um, sign up for something because they don't know if their kids are going to be well that day, <laughs> you know, um, or they may find that, you know, something else even better comes up, and so, so they don't want to sign up if it, if it might not, if they might not be able to go. Um, so, you know, so, and some people, they do sign up and then they don't come. So we have people that come who haven't signed up, people who don't come who did. It all kind of evens out usually, but, you know, it just seems to be easier to make it just a little more spontaneous. We try to be really flexible, and if it's a matter of resources, then sometimes if we don't have enough for every kid, then we have the family do the project together as a group. All right. Um, you know, I don't, I, it's possible, somebody asked, I guess Frank asked if um, they, uh, if they interact with the librarians virtually from home. They may. I don't know if we would know that. Um, I would imagine, we do have, um, I'm in children's, and we don't um, do the chat that the adult librarians do. Um, occasionally, they'll, a question will come through that sounds like it probably is is a, a homeschool question. And so, whoever is monitoring the chat that day has they, periodically they send me an email asking me whatever that question was, so that they can find out, you know, and, and pass it on. Um, I love Amanda's idea of the Dabbler Club with just a little bit of whatever is interesting that month. That's actually kind of similar to to some of how our um, lunch bunch programs run when we run them. Um, and when we're not using outside um, community groups. Yeah. Um, and Jody mentioned that um, their homeschool families are their primary volunteers for Storytime Puppet Shows. Um, we're finding that that our, our homeschool volunteers are some of the best volunteers that we have. And they are, they're able to, um, they are able to help with things during the school day when, of course, you know, kids that are in public school or charter school or whatever can't do it. And so we really enjoy using our volunteers. Okay, um, the ERC, our Educational Resource Center, uh, is something that we opened four months ago. Um, it contains materials to supplement students' homeschool education. And we'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute, but I have a question for you. <coughs> Um, how much would you how much would you estimate that a homeschool family might spend each year educating their children? If you could just put it in the chat. You all have, seem to have a pretty good idea <laughs> about some of this. Okay, well we did a poll with ours. Uh, several years ago just to find out and we did find that it, anywhere between 250 and a thousand dollars per child so it depends some homeschool families just have a few you know one or two kids some have quite a few kids so if they spend a thousand per child it could be quite expensive um, but then that's and this is why we decided that we about four years ago we came up with this idea for an educational resource center we wanted to try to provide some of the manipulatives and other resources that kids have in school, in public schools, but that homeschool families would have to buy for themselves. Um, they, don't, they don't get any funding from the state for their educational purposes, even though they pay taxes to the school districts just like everybody else does. Uh, they do not get anything. So uh, most of this is out of pocket. Uh, we do have uh, one of the ladies on our uh, committee, Melody, who I mentioned before, um, she actually said that she spent very little homeschooling because she used library resources almost exclusively. Now, her son is in his 20s now, so it was quite a while ago, but, um, you know, she said that, I think she said, told me one time that she 
had, she bought a math curriculum uh, a couple of times, but other than that, everything else they used came from the library. And it, back then, it was mostly books and, and movies. Uh, so it's possible to do it for even much less than 250. Okay, uh, when we started talking about this, this uh, Educational Resource Center, we decided that we wanted it to have science equipment in it um, and lab tables. We wanted the software. We wanted, we wanted staff that, that would be there to help people if they needed it, to, you know, to use what we had. We wanted to have kits and manipulatives. We wanted to have computers and access to printing. And we were hoping to have study spaces and gathering areas, too. Uh, we did end up with most of this. Um, the study spaces and gathering areas aren't quite what we'd hoped. But we did, when we came up with this plan, we had no idea where this might be. And at, that, and at the time, we weren't even sure if it might happen. Uh, we've, we were able to uh, put this together um, because they were doing some renovation at my location. And so they and we had a lot of people move out of our location when um, our new library opened about a year, about two years ago. And so uh, it, we were able to do this. And so we just had to kind of work with the space we had. Um, just I want to ask a question real quick before before uh, Jessica starts talking about what we actually have in our Educational Resource Center. Um, does your library have non-traditional items in their collection? I guess, and if so, what do you have? So, you know, beyond beyond books and DVDs and CDs, the sorts of things that everybody has, is there anybody out there that circulates something interesting? And I know we've heard from, I've, I've seen um, articles where some libraries circulate tools and, and puzzles and things like that. I see knitting needles oh, and wow. crochet hooks. That's really neat. Cool. iPads, OK. Cam oh, GoPro cameras, daycare theme kits. We board have games. We have something a little bit like that, too. Board games, toys, neat. American Girl doll. Oh, wow. That is awesome. Great. OK, um, somebody asked, or Nicola, Nicola asked where we get the, got the funding for the ERC. Um, we have, PPLD has a foundation, and which, of course, takes donations. And that is how we got funded. Uh, we actually were given a, more funding than we were expecting. Um, and so we were able to do more with it than we had planned originally. We started um, started the center at, as Gail mentioned, at a time when we were already renovating a couple of our libraries. So our um, our foundation was already seeking donations and looking for grants and that sort yeah. of thing. So we just picked a really good time within our district to to uh, to put this in. Yeah, and also because because of we were going through this renovation, uh, we had fun we had funds for um, for furniture and things um, just for the renovation itself. And we thought we were going to have to have grants to purchase uh, furniture for the ERC. As it turned out, it came out of the renovation funds. So that, that really helped us out, too. We didn't have to provide any of that stuff ourselves. We just have to provide what we put on the in the furniture and on the furniture and, and, and such. I see a question about sustainability funding. So far, we tried to stock up on some of the consumables. And we really looked for things in there that we were hoping would last. So we're going to talk a little bit about what we put in the center. Um, while we did start the center with our homeschoolers in mind, we really wanted it to be open to all of our patrons who wanted to supplement their children's education. So it is an educational resource center. It's not a homeschool center, although we do find that our homeschoolers are the ones that utilize it most often. And we wanted to be sure that we included a variety of subjects for a variety of ages. So we've got some really fun software in there. We've got driver's education, um, dissection software, and also access to our foreign language databases. And these appeal to our homeschool students um, in middle school and high school. Our science lab, half of our center is a science lab with tables and equipment. 
But this lab actually started a few years before we opened the center. We started with some donated equipment that a local school district was getting rid of that they gave us. And we started in a community room with a volunteer um, parent who ran it. We were available you know, only once a month for the, for the kids to use. And now we've been able to purchase additional equipment and we've moved it to the permanent location in the center and it's available whenever our center is open. We've got a lot of science in there, life science, earth science, biology, chemistry, physics, even a little bit of organic chemistry. Uh, we've included some fun technology kits like little bits and snap circuits. Math across a variety of levels from the basics on up to geometry and algebra. And in addition to a bunch of um, language arts kits. We wanted to include Spanish, American Sign Language, and Braille in the center. And then just to round it out, we've also got health, music, art, social studies, including history, cultures, geography, and government. Gail's going to tell you a little bit more about the center. And I wanted to say something else about the sustainability of the funding. Um, at the moment, we're still running off of the money that the foundation gave us. Uh, like I said, they gave us more than we expected, so we still have some. Um, and I, I actually don't know. I'm assuming that we're going to be added to the budget uh, maybe next year. We're not in it this year because we still have funding uh, from the foundation. But I'm hoping that we will be um, will be added into the budget next year. Uh, we. Our, our brand new director and almost brand new uh, associate director both think that the Educational Resource Center is amazing. And so I think with their backing, I think that, that we will be in good shape funding-wise eventually. So right now, like I said, we're in good shape. Um, we also decided that we wanted to make sure people, that the homeschool families could uh, find out exactly what we had in the ERC without actually being there necessarily. So we're having almost everything put into our catalog. Uh, it's not complete yet. It's, a, it's an ongoing pro uh, project. But uh, they can just search ERC in math, let's say, and all of our math kits will come up so they can see what, they, what we have and, and see if that might be something that they could use before they even come in. At the moment, because it's not complete yet, um, I do have lists of the different subject areas and the kits that we have in those subject areas. And so uh, we've been printing them off for people who ask. This is just a picture of one end of our Educational Resource Center. Um, the rug in the front is the very first thing that came. Um, in fact, we didn't even know they'd ordered it. We, we had picked it, but we didn't know they had actually ordered it for us. Um, we have color-coordinated bins in these cubby units. They're kind of the things you might find at a daycare center, maybe. Um, but we've got, you know, we have two others that you can't see um, in this picture. So we've got, you know, math is one color, language arts is one color, uh, science is one color, and so on. And our big cab uh, cabinets in the back also are, they're totally full, which is kind of sad because we have no expansion space. But we have more kits back there, usually for the older kids, or things that just didn't fit in bins. Um, you know, we have, we have a skeleton who's a little gimpy at the moment. We need to get a new one. He's got a, a leg that's super glued together and his head has a tendency to turn around backwards. But, um, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to get things working. We have a projector up at the top on the ceiling so we can uh, project things from a, a laptop if we want. We also have electricity in the ceiling up there. That's what that black and yellow thing is up there. So we can plug in our electric uh, microscopes that we have. Uh, this is the other end. We've got three computers. Uh, our main uh, sci our computer lab, people have to sign up for it, and they can only use it for a limited period of time. Our three computers are not on that same system, so kids can come in. They could potentially use them for as long as they needed to. Um, the little uh, uh, light-colored desk there, that those have early literacy toys in it. Um, like I said, families come en masse, so there's something for younger siblings to do, too. We also have a few uh, uh, chair. There's another chair you can't see, but that the, the uh, little couch is there. Uh, I have to say it's very uncomfortable. It's the hardest couch I think I've ever sat in, but people seem to like it. 
Okay, um, and then, you know, we, we get some wonderful comments from people. Um, you know, East Library is where I happen to work, and so the, the top one just is from somebody who happened to go to one of our programs there. Uh, everybody who goes to any of the programs we do, they're, they're so appreciative because they, because they don't have the opportunities that the, the public school kids have, that these are something special just for them. Um, the center uh, quote that's in there, we have, we live in a very transient area. We have three military uh, uh, bases here in town. And so we have a lot of military moving in and out. And I can't tell you how many times I've heard from people who said, you know, where they used to live, they didn't do anything for homeschoolers. They didn't even feel like they were welcome at the library. And so, you know, they, they really appreciate what we offer because it's so different from what they experienced before. So it's, you know, even if, if you don't do homeschool programming yet, um, I can guarantee that if you start doing it, they're going to appreciate it. Uh, they just they just love doing it. And of course, that bottom one, do it again, please. That's one of the greatest greatest things we like to hear because um, we know we've done it done something right there. I see a question about whether the ERC space replaced other resources. So we did it at a time when we were transitioning and renovating. And so the space where it is is actually upstairs in one of our buildings. It used to be actually a manager's office and a conference room. And when we expanded one of our other libraries, we were able to move that manager's office and the conference rooms um, to the, the new library, and that opened up some space. Okay. But we have seen where a library has done it in just a, a closet space um, and had just you know a little bit of space for, for people um, or um, a shelf or um, a cubby space, a locking cabinet. So it doesn't have to be huge. Okay. All righty. Um, we would love it if those of you who are participating today, if you would like to collaborate on ideas for working with homeschoolers. And to do that, uh, a couple of years ago, we put together a uh, homeschoolers wiki. And this is, it's, it's not for homeschoolers, it's just for, for library staff, basically. But it's just a place, it has different pages on it, a place where you can put down ideas that have worked for you, you can get, give more um, examples. Some of the things, some of the programs we mentioned today are listed on this wiki and with more information about how we went about planning it, you know, how much time it took, um, what, worked, what worked and what didn't. Um, anyway. We would love it if you would become a member of this wiki. Uh, you just have to request um, to be added to it, and that request comes to me, Gail, and um, I will definitely say yes. And you don't have to be in Colorado to do this. This is for anybody. So I, we may mention Colorado because that's it. Kind of started out that way, but there's at least one or two members who are from other states already. So please consider joining this. We would love to have you do that. see um, and I guess I, if, if you could um, we would love it if you could share any other online resources that you know about um, in the chat win window and Christine said that they can be posted on the CSL in session website later so please feel free to do that we would love to, to get some more resources and um, this is Beth maybe while people are typing in their online resources you could talk more about reaching teens specifically we had that question and, you know, and that is hard. Um, teens are busy, and even, you know, homeschool teens are just as busy as uh, public school and private school teens are. You know, they're, they're um, starting to have jobs, or they're volunteering other places. Um, it's just, it's, it's really hard to entice them to come. Uh, when the, we had, some of our science programs have been the most interesting to them. When we had the Mindstorms, we had a good group that came. Um, we had another, I was trying to think, there was another one we had when we divided the kids up by ages, and there were a surprising number of older kids there. I, I, as I, I'm trying to remember what it was now. I think when we first started, um, our volunteer wanted to have a day when he just talked about the scientific method. And, um, and there were quite a few older kids that worked with him. Um, there were pr probably eight, nine, maybe, something like that. So it, it just depends. Um, 
you know, maybe working with your teen department or your teen librarians, um, get some ideas from them. Um, we have found that um, some of our best volunteers at the library are homeschoolers. And sometimes they can come in some of those, you know, not, you know, during school hours. So if you've, um, you know, if you've got some of them coming in um, that you can catch there um, and, and have them start volunteering, because a lot of them are looking for volunteer work, then you can kind of work with them and see, you know, what else they might be interested in coming to um, and also let them know what's going on. Yeah. Um, we, when they did this renovation, they also added a, um, a maker space right next to where we are. And so we're talking with uh, some of the uh, library or library staff that works in there about doing something together maybe. Um, and maybe that will draw the, the teens in there too. Uh, we yeah. are getting close yeah. to yeah. 1 o'clock, yeah. so we're going to go ahead and hey, Gail's got one yeah. last. I've got one last question. Here's our, our uh, contact information. Um, Jessica and I are there. I also put Tina there too, um, just because of her experience with homeschooling her own kids. If you have questions about, you know, what homeschoolers might need from a library more than what we've talk, talked about today, she would be an awesome, awesome contact for that. And I know she would be more than happy to, to get back with you. Um, but there's just one more quick question. I think we can still do it. Um, was there something that you saw today in our presentation that triggered an idea? And what is one thing that you could do at your library to support your homeschoolers? That Something that, that you were excited about trying? If you could share it in the chat box. So really quickly, Tina was the one who homeschooled six kids over 20 over 20 years. So she's a great resource. A lot of um, a lot of the ideas um, and the programs that we presented, um, she had something to do with. She just un unfortunately couldn't be here today. I see a lot of you guys excited about the curriculum swap. I love that. And you know, we we um, talked to homeschool families at a um, focus group meeting one time and asked if something like that would be of any interest to them. And oh my gosh, they said absolutely, positively yes. So we've been doing it ever since. So that was one thing that was actually suggested. The science fair also was suggested by a homeschool mom who thought who had had been to one with her child once before and thought it was a great idea and. She didn't actually help us plan that first one, but um, I every year when she comes and her kids participate, I thank her for the suggestion. <laughs> and co-ops sometimes do have um, swaps. A lot of times they are not free. Um, they, you know, because people really, they spent so much money on their curriculum and their manipulatives, they would like to get a little bit of that money back so they could put it into something else. Um, so you might check with the, the co-ops, um, you know, if they have something, if it's free, uh, you might be, it might be redundant. Um, but if they, if they are actually selling things instead of just giving them away, um, a giveaway might really help someone who doesn't have that much money to spend or who's just getting started in homeschooling and, and doesn't want to put a lot of money into it until they're sure that that's what they want to do. Well, this is Christine, and I'm just going to do a quick wrap up here. And I, I forgive me that the chat seemed to change a little bit. Um, but if you do have any other questions, continue to type them in the chat. But I wanted just really quickly to one thank our presenters for today, um, and thank everybody who did attend and shared some of the ideas that you have, some of the things that you're trying. On the CSL in session website later this afternoon, I will post the slides, the recorded archive of the session, um, a lot of the resources that were shared. Excuse me, in the chat. Um, the link to the wiki and all of these things so you guys can go back and revisit. I did want to let you all know that our next CSL in session will be on March 22nd at noon. Um, someone here from the Colorado State Library is going to lead a lively discussion on how leading doesn't have to be out loud. And as always, because we like, you know, stats, um, if you all could, if you have a moment, take a brief survey from today's session. You should be able to click on the link in the window, but I'm putting it in the chat area as well. Um, but we'd love to know uh, what you thought about today's session um, and ways that we can continue to improve CSL in session before. And I saw a question from Kathy. I can send you a certificate that shows that you kind of showed up for today's session if you want to put 
your um, email in the chat. I will make sure to get that to you. If anybody else needs a certificate, just type your email in the chat area and I will get those off to you hopefully later today. Um, uh, but once again, thanks to everybody for attending and thank you to our presenters. And if you guys have any last minute questions, now's your chance. I'm going to be making a lot of certificates, I can see. That's great. Yes, the archive, um, I should be